What's going on guys? Jackson here from Vendetta Sports Media and welcome to another episode of the Court is in Session podcast, part of the Vendetta Sports Media podcasting network. If you guys enjoy today's video, if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell if you want to be notified whenever a new episode of the podcast or any of the numerous shows and podcasts and videos that we got going on, you will be notified whenever a new one drops. Or if you're listening to us on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcast, we greatly appreciate you as well. Today, joining me, we have another Vendetta writer, keeping it in-house again for this episode, uh, Garrett Burrows. Garrett, how are you doing today, man? Doing pretty good, dude. I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I've, I'm not going to lie. I've been slacking on my my NBA follow for this season. I've been I've been pretty heavy into college football and NFL this year, so I've been kind of slacking a little bit. But I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited yeah, but to it, chat NBA with you. It's it's paying off though because you're you're going somewhere big soon. I'm aren't leaving. You? I'm leaving on Sunday for Los Angeles because uh, I'll be at the College Football National Championship See, for there, Vendetta Sports Media. There you go. That's that's big time. Congratulations. Thank Man, you, thank I know, you. yeah, I know, I, you've gotten to do some some cool things in the past. What, what was it? Was it the Big East tournament that you covered? I did the uh, NIT or final NIT, that's at it. MSG in March last year. That's what it was. That's right. That's right. I knew it was MSG, and I know sometimes Big East. Uh, and I think the Big East, Big East used to run their yeah. their tournament like exclusively out of MSG. I think they used to do almost all their games out of there. But yeah, yeah. Uh, the NIT also did their semifinal and final out of MSG almost every year, except this year. They are in Las Vegas, I think. Okay. So. Well, either way, like, so congratulations to you. You're getting to do some some really cool stuff. I know we're probably going to have some more riders uh, in more football-related content going to the Senior Bowl down in Mobile, Alabama. I was supposed to go last year, but I ended up getting COVID, so I could not I go, that's, yeah, unfortunately. That's and I am not going to get to go again this year. So it's still on the bucket list. Uh, to go, which I was just going for the game anyway. It wasn't like I was going to be there for the whole week, uh, which is right. which is really like what going down there and covering it and covering for the, the media is is, kind of is being there from like start to, to finish. yeah, and, and it's 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 being there and like getting one on one interviews and talks with a lot of the the seniors that are there, the prospects, and also getting to talk to a lot of other people in the business and making connections. And I I've seen where other other uh, media members have met up there and that's kind of like where they've gotten their start. So it's a big opportunity for people. So hopefully one of these days I will get to uh, attend uh, that. But anyway, we've got a pretty full show for you guys uh, today. There's not a whole lot necessarily in the news. It's been kind of a quiet NBA year. It's kind of weird to say that now quiet in the sense of like outside news. We do have, we are going to talk here in just a moment about it's kind of old news, but it's still relevant because it keeps popping up. And it's Trey Young, Atlanta, Nate McMillan, what's going on with that situation. There's also been a lot of talk recently about Nikola Jokic versus... Um, oh, excuse me. I got to take a drink of water. Oh, gosh. Luka Doncic. I was about to choke and die there for a second in case in, in case you didn't see it. Like, my eyes just got, like, really big. I was like, oh, gosh. But anyway, he the Nikola... Like, he had, like, saucers <laughs> in his eyes. But anyway, uh, Nikola Jokic versus Luka Doncic. A lot of people are debating who they would rather build their, uh, their franchise around. And then we're going to lead off with because... Uh, or end with talking about offense versus defense in the NBA because I say it's been quiet, but not from a, a scoring perspective this season the scoring has been nuts this season but let's just hop right into it so the Atlanta Hawks have kind of been disappointing a little bit to say the least this year I'm bringing up their team page right here because I accidentally uh, exited off of it um the Hawks disappointing had a great start to the season uh they were seven and three at one point they had won Quite a few good games. They'd beaten New York in New York, beat New Orleans, beat Milwaukee. But ever since kind of the early mid parts of November, they've really kind of fallen apart. The DeJounte Murray trade looked like it was going to be really good. And DeJounte Murray has played fairly well for them this season. But this team just cannot string together wins. And a lot of people, what a lot of the news that is coming out about the Atlanta Hawks is that there's some tension 
between their star point guard, Trey Young, who was part of what everybody was saying was the most even trade in NBA history uh, between the Hawks and the uh, and the Mavs, and I'm I'm not completely sold on that. Uh, but then also their head coach Nate McMillan. That there's a lot of these two these two stars, these two personalities are starting to really uh, butt heads. So, Garrett, I just want you what I just want you to give me your initial reactions to it, and then we're going to kind of talk about the possibility of Trey Young moving on and and where to if it if it comes to that if it comes to that so just give me your initial thoughts about the situation that's happening in Atlanta right now well the the whole situation is kind of crazy because I th- the, if correct me if I'm wrong the whole situation started when Trey Young was like nursing a, a, a slight shoulder injury and there was question about if he was going to participate in shoot around and Nate McMillan was just like well you can either dress and be on the bench or you're not going to play and then Young was just like Peace. I'm leaving. And he like left the arena or something, right? He didn't even sit on the bench for the game. Yeah. He that 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 kind of leads to maybe the overall type of team player that Trey Young potentially is. I'm not gonna you know point names or name fingers or anything because obviously I don't know the guy. I don't know a whole lot about what happens in Atlanta, but I think it's interesting that there was all this hype around the Atlanta Hawks, as you mentioned. The 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 Dejounte Murray trade from San Antonio was really viewed as this is going to be the piece that kind of pushes Atlanta over the hump. They're going to have that defensive stopper at guard, which is what DeJounte Murray is kind of known for. And as a ball facilitator, which would play really well with um, Trey, uh, Trey Young, but it hasn't been the case because I, Trey Young shooting 31% from three point range this year, which is ridiculously low based on what he is known for as being a great shooter. I think that this, this trade hasn't, worked out in the sense that they were maybe hoping for. And I think that it kind of sheds some light on maybe Atlanta should potentially try to move on from Trey Young. Cause they could probably get a pretty nice ransom from a team that is a contender kind of looking for that one last piece. Yeah. And you are right. in about where it started, it 100% had to deal with that. And, th- and we've seen this happen plenty of times and it, and it never ends well, whenever you have your star player and your head coach butting heads. Now, it's funny how the NBA works. The NBA, which I guess sports in general, are very much a what have you done for me lately type of, of, of atmosphere. And Nate McMillan, while he hasn't done anything recently, last year or this season, we're not too far separated from when Nate McMillan stepped in, took over in the middle of the season, and the Hawks went on an impressive run into the playoffs and and won a playoff series. They won a yeah, playoff didn't, series. Didn't they, uh, didn't they upset Philadelphia yes. in the playoffs? Yes, they made it to the Eastern Conference Finals that year, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Again, it, it feels like it's been forever, but it actually hasn't been that long ago. Yeah, so, 2000. It yeah. was their first conference finals since 14-15. They beat the top seeded 76ers in the second round. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, they beat the Knicks and then they beat the 76ers. Yeah, because that's where oh, crazy. that's where that's where Trey Young became the villain of New York. He became a real life Batman villain. That 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 <laughs> Just series. Just a straight vigilante Lady. in New York. <laughs> <laughs> but and and again, it's crazy to think of the highs and the lows of an organization. How everything can switch so quickly in just two short years, and. It's always, again, and this never ends well because maybe there is some merit. Maybe uh, Coach McMillan's, uh, maybe what's been assembled, he can't coach with. Maybe someone else can coach with. So maybe you have to move on from the head coach and find that new head coach. Maybe it is the All Star. Maybe Trey Young is being a bit of a, a bit of a diva and kind of over nursing that injury, or for whatever reason, he just doesn't want to play for uh, uh, McMillan anymore. Or maybe you have to look at the front office and maybe they just haven't assembled this team the right way for that can put Trey Young in a position to win and for McMillan to be a successful head coach. But usually the road eventually does lead down to the star player being traded. Now, I don't think this would have. I I don't. I actually think it's not going to happen this season. I don't think we see anything major by the deadline or anything. And in fact, I wouldn't even. It's not out of the realm of possibility that it doesn't happen in this next off season, because he's your star player. You're going to do everything in your power to make him 
happy. So if anything, McMillan is gone first, and then they'll bring in a new head coach, and he'll have a year or so to figure things out. So we may be a little bit jumping the gun here, but it's always fun to to speculate. And, you know, the NBA, the landscape could change in the next two to three years, but we got you can kind of see where teams that are stagnant, where they can be teams that are missing pieces, um, you can kind of tell the future a little bit almost now obviously you know you you could have something where it's like the 10th team that has the best odds in the draft all of a sudden they get the number one uh draft and they they draft victor women yama or they get uh scoot henderson and then they just you know they just their their franchise has changed forever because that's what happened with the pelicans and the grizzlies so we'll speculate here for a little bit garrett when do you see if at any time in the near possible future trey young getting moved and just give me like one or two teams that you think he could be a really good fit in. To answer the first part of the question, when I think he could get traded, I agree with you that I don't think Atlanta moves him this year. I think that there is too much tension between him and McMillan. I think that you get rid of McMillan. He was talking about retiring like during the season. There was, there was conversations about retiring mid-season, so you already know McMillan's kind of checked out already. Yeah. If it's not that difficult to just cut ties with him, say, hey, thanks for what you've done for the organization in the past. We're going to go a separate way. Bring in, I honestly don't even know some of the biggest coaching options for to bring in for Atlanta. Maybe they bring in an interim guy. Maybe they hire somebody off of a bench or something. I think that Atlanta makes a move at the deadline, and they finally pull the trigger on trading away John Collins. Yeah, it feels like John Collins has been on the trade block for like three years now. I think that they Atlanta should see that this this team isn't built to win. A, they even make a, a playoff run right now, and that's kind of what they've designed this team for. I think the teams could use a guy like John Collins down on the block. I think that they, like I said, fire McMillan and they trade away John Collins at the deadline. Maybe, like you said, give him another year or so. Maybe at the deadline next year. Maybe Atlanta's still kind of floundering. Maybe Trey Young still isn't living up to all the potential that he had from like years past. Maybe they move him then. Or if there was a trade to happen this year at the deadline, I don't know how they'd make it work because I think they only have one valuable pick in the future. I think it's like 2025 or 2027 unprotected first round pick that the Lakers have. But they they do... they package that pick because it's going to be garbage that pick's going to be terrible yeah in like three or four years because lebron's going to be gone if they if they ever wise up and trade away anthony davis just go into complete rebuild mode i think that the lakers see the roster is well lebron's not getting any younger we need to try to put pieces around him to make another run in the deadly western conference i think that i think the clearest option if there was a trade to happen this year is probably the lakers yeah, and I mean, I agree with you because, but also that trade package is like so bad too that the Lakers could put together because like the trade package that they can put together is like barely enough to like go get someone like Buddy Heald from the Kings uh, or, you know, maybe, or no, Buddy Heald's not on the Kings, Buddy Heald and Miles Turner from the, the Pacers. I'm for whatever reason, my mind's back in like 2017, 2018. Um, happens all the time. Uh, I was trying to look up Trey Young's contract, and he is extended through uh, the deal includes. Let me see here. The deal an early termination option in 2025, which is which is interesting. Okay, so the deal technically runs through 26 and 27. But he can opt out of the deal, looks like, in 25, 26. So they don't have too much time to figure this out. And if Trey Young is unhappy, then he could... Good Lord, he's making $46 million that that year of the draft. Dude, dude's getting his back. Yeah. And he, the way he's playing this year, it's just... It's such an overpay. It, it is quite the overpay. And I agree. They're, again, they're going to do everything in their power. You do not... All conventional thought says not to trade your all-star or your superstar player while you're like sort of kind of trying to compete and trying to win and you make moves like the DeJounte Murray move. I will say, however, that the Pelicans did go against 
a little bit against conventional thought because they were making trades and trying to win up until the off season that they did finally move off of Anthony Davis. They cashed in the Anthony Davis chips. They didn't wait too much longer, which obviously, again, I know Anthony Davis was wanting out and that team wasn't going anywhere. But if you're not going anywhere and you have a superstar that you can cash in, you might as well try to cash in on them early. So maybe at the end of next season is when they look to try to move Trey Young because you get that. First off, the market's also broken right now because of the Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell trades. And you could try, you could get a haul for Trey Young and you could justify it and other teams could justify it. Donovan Mitchell just dropped 71 points the other day. More on that later. Rudy Gobert has kind of been not great <laughs> and the Timberwolves Ooh, might yeah, be that was, that's the, been a rough one. the Timberwolves might be regretting that trade just just a little bit I don't think any of us were really big fans here at Vendetta of of that trade when that occurred I think we all clowned them and I think we're all being proven right uh on on that uh front but yeah I don't know I'm trying to think I'm trying to look at the outlook of of some of these teams uh into into the future um, the Magic have amassed a lot of um, good players, young players that they potentially in two to three years uh, could move off of. Uh, you'd obviously have to look at someone like Houston, uh, maybe not San Antonio. Obviously, OKC and Utah are going to be in talks just because of the vast number of picks. And if Sam, they have, they have like half the first. Yeah, round yeah. If Sam, if Sam draft. Presti or Danny Ainge want Trey Young, they're getting Trey Young. Yeah. And if they both want Trey Young, then Atlanta wins the lottery because it's going to be a bidding war. It's like, no, I, I, all yeah, right, I'll give you four first, first picks. picks. I'll yeah. give you five first round picks. Oh no, get, I'll give you six and then two second round picks. And then it's just it just goes out of hand from there. The, those those two teams have so much ammunition uh, for for the future. It's it's outrageous. Um, and yeah, as far as like a replacement, I don't know who they would get for as a replacement for McMillan. I'd have to, I'd have to look and see like who would be available in this upcoming. Cause after, after this season, do, do they try to make a run at, uh, Oduka from, uh, from, uh, <laughs> from Boston? Maybe. I mean, but at the same time you have to consider, is Atlanta even that enticing of a job? Not really. I don't know that I don't know that it is. I don't think that Atlanta's in a position to go get a superstar head coach. I don't think they can get Inukota from Boston because, like, Inukoda. I don't. What? What? Nice. Why would? Why would I want to go somewhere where I already know the point guard's unhappy, and we're likely going to have to trade him? What Atlanta's mm-hmm. going to have to do, I feel like, is they're going to have to go to Trey Young in the offseason and be like, "All right, we got rid of McMillan. Who do you want as coach?" And basically let Trey Young pick the coach. Yeah, and then. Yeah. Again, I think what they'll do, they have to move John Collins at the trade deadline this season because he's going to be in high demand, as as always happens around the trade deadline. Again, it's been super quiet. I don't think there's been a single trade in the NBA. I could be wrong. There's at least have not been one uh, significant. San Antonio just traded away Noah Vonley to somebody. Let me let me look that real okay, quick. Okay, look it up. But as far as like significant trades go, not oh, just it, not yeah. just like fringe role players, and it's kind of dumping off cash. Because I did I did see that because someone created a roster spot. I, I forgot. I've already forgotten what trade that was, but someone created a roster spot, and people are like, hmm, interesting, because Kimball Walker got got cut, and there was speculation there. But anyway, we will move on. Enough Atlanta Hawks talk. Uh, I've gotten clowned enough from Hawks fans uh, in the uh, in the past. I didn't give them, I did not believe in them that year that they went to the Eastern Conference Finals, and I got clowned on YouTube, and I was like, oh, okay, maybe they proved me wrong, and so I tried to give them their flowers next season, and then they absolutely Look how went that kaput. So never trusting the Atlanta Hawks uh, again. Now we get into a discussion that no bias whatsoever from you. In this discussion, I'm I'm no, sure, no, 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 no. but and again, this is a lot. This has to do with a lot because both of these players are, are having astronomically crazy, crazy statistical seasons. 
They're both amazing young players, two foreign players that are actually, I think, fairly good friends in real life, too. Uh, which is odd that we're going to be talking about them in this capacity, which they did the same thing for, for John Zion. They're, they grew up together in, in right. South Carolina, and then they're pitting them against each other. Who would you rather have? And it's like, no, we're, we're cool with each other. Exactly. But I've been seeing a lot of talk on Twitter recently about the Luka Doncic uh, and Nikola Jokic. Who would you rather have in a, in a vacuum to build your team uh, around? And so, Garrett, again, I think I know – what your answer is going to be as a Nuggets fan, but I still want to hear you discuss it anyway. So I think I I'm, I'm going to try to leave as much bias on the wayside as possible. But you, you probably you are right. You probably know my answer. I think you have to look at this two different ways, though. You have to look at overall growth versus where the player is now. Because if you look at overall growth, when Nikola Jokic came into the league. He was the he was a second round pick. He was pretty decent on offense. He could pass the ball pretty well. Was a total defensive liability. He could not defend to save his life. In close games, uh, George Carl transitioning to Michael Malone would always pull Nikola Jokic out of close games when they're on defense because he was just awful. And that's and that's putting it kindly. He was not mm-hmm. very good at defense at all. Whereas if you look at him now he does not get the respect he deserves on the block for the defense that he provides in the post because he has got, he, that's one of the biggest things he works on in the off season for the last two or three seasons is post defense. And he, his block numbers have gone up. His defensive rating has gone up. I think the last, at least two or three years, if not the last three or four years. So if you, if you look at that, I think the growth and the evolution is more on Nikola Jokic's side. However, if you look at what the league is needing now, it there seems to be more of a demand for guard play than there is for big men. So while I do understand the idea of let's go grab a guy and build around Doncic instead over Jokic, because if you look at their if you look at their comparative numbers, Luka Doncic right now is averaging thirty four this year, and Nikola Jokic is averaging twenty five. Uh, total rebounds. Luka Doncic is still averaging nine rebounds, and he has uh, nine assists a game. He's averaging 34.99. He's basically a walking triple-double. You can't knock him for it. However, Nikola Jokic is a walking triple-double on any given night. He's the greatest passing big man in NBA history, and there's I don't think there's any close second. I, th- I think we can yeah. go ahead and establish he's the best 100%. passing big in, in history. 100%. It, it all depends... It kind of also depends on like what kind of offense you want to run X, Y, and Z. If it was me, obviously I am biased. I'm taking Nikola Jokic every day of the week and twice on Sunday. I don't. I don't think there's any debate. I have him as the best player in the league right now. I think he's better than Giannis. He's better than KD. He's got Luca. I. I. I think he won't win a third MVP this year because of voter fatigue. But I. I would argue that I don't know that there's a player more pivotal to their team right now than Nikola Jokic. So I think if if I'm building an organization right now, I'm taking Jokic. No questions. Yeah, and I think what's what's helping Luka in this instance right now is the fact that the Mavericks are doing so well this season. Currently, they are the fourth seed, and then the Nuggets are the one seed. So this is a fun this is a fun discussion. Personally, like. This one is really is really tough for me because I do enjoy the play of both players, but for different reasons, obviously. Like Luca's Luca's definitely a lot more flashy and and everything. Uh he does make some incredible passes, but then it's like I love just like almost like the fundamental classic game that Jokic has. And then you want to talk about passing. The passes every night that I watch a, a a Nuggets game, and it's not every night, but anytime I do catch a Nuggets game, there's at least two or three times where I ask myself, "How did Jokic get that pass off?" And it, it's pretty funny. I think I saw in an interview where he said sometimes he gets into the paint, and they ask him like how he makes these incredible throws like to the corner, and he just says, "Well, our offense just has someone in the corner, so he's not even looking, and so he just throws it in the corner, expecting someone to be there, and it just so happens that someone is there because in the modern NBA you just have dudes sitting in the corner, and then three guys doing their thing at the top of the key." But from an offensive perspective, I do like the idea of having of running my offense through a big 
rather than a pure like guard standpoint like iso ball almost because there's the versatility with a big of what you can do with Jokic is is incredible honestly like you can you can run your like traditional uh pick and rolls he can obviously shoot so you can pick and pop he can he can dribble the ball he can take the ball up the court so you can run some sets at the top of key some dribble handoffs like that uh but you could also just get him the ball top of the key and then just you're running all other types of motion everywhere else and he has such a high IQ when it comes to passing the ball and understanding the game that he's going to make the correct pass or he is going to put himself in a position to help others succeed and Luka does the same thing as well and and it, they both just make the game look so easy like honestly like I saw I saw Jokic make an and one layup in their in their blowout win against against the Clippers uh which shout out to the Clippers I live bet them to cover at 33 and a half points and they just did that <laughs> that three with like 12 seconds left push them into cover range so thank you guys i appreciate that uh, <laughs> that was a that was a nice little uh twenty dollars uh twenty dollars uh, extra in my pocket from that Li- live betting a team down 30 <laughs> points is no here's the thing they were, they were down by 40 and the line was 33 and a half and i was like this is gonna happen because I've got another. They were, they were getting doubled at the half. I think at the half yeah. was sixty six to thirty two. Yeah, but Jokic he made an and one layup, and where everyone's like acting all big and strong and struggling and like struggling to get it through and like flexing and everything, he just he just got hit, and it was just like a, a simple little two step drive, and then just laid it up and in, and it looked like it was nothing. It looked like it looked like he like mentally had checked out. And it was just like instinct carried over, and he's just like, eh, whatever. You know, so, oh, oh, I got fouled. I made the bucket. Okay, I go shoot the free yeah. throw. Okay, I'm I'm good. It's whatever. Because you could you could kind of tell he was checked out. I will say the one knock on Jokic is that when he's mentally checked out of a game, then then that's it. He's done. That that is an issue with most of the Nuggets roster, to be fair. And and I think that is this is obviously a conversation for another time. But I think that Michael Malone tends to have an issue keeping the guys motivated twenty four seven. So you are exactly right. Yeah, and the, and like the fact that they jumped out to the on the Clippers like so early, like obviously someone like Bones Highland was engaged, and of course that the picture, the image of him where he made his insane layup and he looks at the camera, that is going to be a wonderfully memed <laughs> image that is going to make Forever. its way on NBA Twitter Twitter for generations uh, to come. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a but that was a that was a really fun game. I, I like I lean Jokic, but it's close in my mind. Because I again, I am trying to be as unbiased as possible. And you're right, Jokic may not win. He probably isn't going to win the MVP. And there's nothing wrong with that because he's already won two MVPs. And then of course there's voter fatigue because they're all like, okay, well you've won two MVPs, but you haven't done anything in the playoffs. Go do something in the playoffs, and we'll reconsider our votes. Because it looked like Giannis early on in the season could win MVP again because the Bucks were on fire. He was playing fantastically, and um he'd actually won a championship since the last time he right. had been voted an MVP. So everyone's like, ah, we can vote him for MVP again. But Luca looks like the MVP right now. His team's in a position to where um, I think voters would be comfortable. Like, you know, if they were still the sixth seed or the seventh seed, you could do it. But people are like, ah, we're going to be really? pretty upset. About yeah. People it. are going to be upset because people, people were with Russell Westbrook too, even though, because the justification was he, they got a triple double, but they were the sixth seed. Right. Uh, that season and everyone's like yeah but it was like they were a they but were he got the team. triple doubles yeah. <laughs> like come on but yeah i it leans it leans Jokic in my opinion but it's it's very much i think depending on the mood i could under i could understand and especially when it comes to like roster construction and things like that but again personally for me i like having a big that i could run my offense through guard play is absolutely important and maybe it's just because again i'm a little bit biased not because i'm a nuggets fan but just me being as a grizzlies fan seeing how the grizzlies have utilized jaron jackson jr over the course of like their past five to seven games where it's been more of a post centric game getting him the ball down low and letting him work and if nothing's there kind of swinging the ball back out and around and getting the open shots a different way that's just like the type of offense that i like because i think it opens up more than when it's just a guard at the top of the key and then you're having to rely on him to do everything. 
I think, and again, I find basketball sexier when there's when there's off ball movement, when there's backdoor cuts, when there's good solid screens, there's ball movement. You get the open shot, you pass up a good shot, and you get a great shot. That's the stuff that really tickles my pickle when it comes it to gets basketball. You going. Yeah, it it, it does. Gets the people going. Yeah. Uh, what what was it? Bagdona said it makes it a, a whopper of a. Whopper of oh, a time. And that, yeah, the whopper. Or oh, he just said it too. And yeah. I never <laughs> yeah. Damn it. He's got. He's gonna have to write it down. He's gonna have to do some sort of post where he. It's a real it. whopper. Yeah. I think that's what it was. That was a real whopper. Yeah. It was a real whopper of a time. <laughs> that just sounds like such like a mid east, uh, or like 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 or Midwest like a Midwest like type of saying. I don't know. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Again, thank you guys if you're still listening and watching to us ramble on about basketball here for a few minutes. We're just two guys that are just having a good time, hanging out, talking about basketball. Um, We've got just one more segment for you guys. It's a fairly short episode today. None of the two-hour hauls that we've been doing (laughs) on the last couple of episodes uh, with our last couple of guests. Uh, Really fun and everything. But I think this one will take up quite a bit of time, and it's going to require some setup. And it's going to also include uh, a player that we just talked about in in Luka Doncic, as well. So I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you some stats here. There's just just some small stats. I didn't dig too far deep into it because it's a massive rabbit hole. Right. But the scoring this season in the NBA is some of the best that it's ever been. Some of the highest scoring games that it's ever been. When I am on Twitter. And you see, like, the stat channels. They're posting stats from recent play of players. It's like Giannis over the last five games. 32 points, 35 points, 37 points, 30 points, 31 points. Luca over the last few games, you know, 40-something, 50-something. You know, he had his 51-point game uh, to close out. Uh, he had a well. He had a sixty-point game, and then he had a fifty-one-point game. <laughs> shortly, shortly after, talk about it. Talk about a run. But and then, of course, we just had Donovan Mitchell's seventy-one-point performance, which, by the way, is the eighth most points ever scored in an NBA game, tying David Robinson and Elgin Baylor for eighth place. Um, of course, you have Wilt Chamberlain at the top with a hundred, and Kobe right behind him. With 81. But so far, let me count here. The highest scoring games, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 players that have scored 50 or more this season. We're not even halfway through the NBA season. You have 14 14 different instances because you also have, again, you have Luka that scored 60 December 27th. And then Luka 51 December 31st. It has just been an absolute... And I saw the, a stat, and I wish I would have saved it specifically for this instance, and I just didn't have time to really go dig deep in Twitter to find it. But I think this is the most 40-plus point games the NBA has ever seen to this point. Ever. It's like the second closest was like 1961. There's been like... Oh, when the plumbers were playing. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> when the league was mostly white people. That's when, <laughs> that's when, that's when there were the most 60 point games, but it, it, this just blows every season out of the water. But then it's like, we have this high octane offense. So is it, and, 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 I'm, and I'm bringing up a game here to kind of prove a point because the parody in the NBA is so great right now. Anybody can go off. I'm bringing up this game. This happened a few nights ago. This is the Oklahoma City Thunder versus the Boston Celtics. OKC won this game 150 to 117. Okay? You had players like... You had uh, Jalen Williams. Okay? Spelled J-A-L-E-N because you have uh, two Jalen Williams is on... (laughs) On a... On a... Yeah, they have two Jalen Williamses. They drafted them like back to back in this past NBA draft. They're both rookies. Hell but yeah. you had the first Jalen. He dropped 21. Josh Giddy dropped 25. Lou Dort, 23. Then you had Trey Mann drop 21. And then Isaiah Joe, who was cut, 
who was cut last year. They picked him up this season as a free agent because he was cut as a rookie or after, like, I think his rookie season or, like, two seasons with the 76ers. He dropped 21 in the game as well. That is one, two, three, four. That is five players that scored over 20 points. And this is against a Celtics team that is favored to win the title. So I got to bring up this question. Is the offense, is the talent in the league, because again, the parity is massive in the league right now. You know, we can't laugh at, you know, if the Nuggets go out and lose to the Magic, you know, because the Magic, they've got some dudes on there. Franz Wagner, uh, Paolo Banquero, they've got some hoopers on that squad. Okay, we can't laugh at that anymore. Like we could, right. like, if this, if this Celtics team had lost to like, the Charlotte Bobcats back in the day. Okay. Like we can't, we can't laugh at them anymore. Is the offense in the NBA, is it just so great and so awesome that there's literally nothing that the average NBA player can do about it? Or are the NBA players in today, are they lazy and they don't play defense? I think it's a mixture of both. Um, I would lean, and, if, and uh, that probably sounds like a cop out to everyone mm. listening to this. Oh, you have to pick one. I, I'm, I'm sort of going to pick one. I think that if I was forced to pick, is the offense better or is the defense worse? I'm probably going to pick the offense is better. Um, I do think that it is a cop out, and one of your, I think your clearest example is Jalen Brown in Boston. Jalen Brown came into the league as a defensive player who kind of really couldn't shoot at all, and he's turned into an offensive weapon, but a liability on defense. So that goes to speak to not, not not a liability. Obviously that's a bit dramatic, but he is not the defensive stopper that he once was when he came into the league. I think that speaks to the players when they get back on defense, maybe being a little lazy. However, I got some stats here for you. There you go. Since 2015, uh, the points per game has gone up every single year without, without question. Uh, In 2015, the average points per game was 102. Uh, this year, they're averaging 114 points per game, which, as you alluded to, is like the the highest ever. It's the the scoring this year is crazy. Um, your pace of play is higher, which for, for anyone listening, pace of play is the number of possessions per game. Uh, your field goal percentage is up. Your three point attempts and three point makes are also up from 2015 as well. All of these stats that I'm giving you are from 2015 and beyond. Uh, in 2015, your average three points made per game was 8.5 and 24 attempted. This year, they're averaging 12.2 threes made per game and shooting 34 of them. So you're talking about 10 more three-pointers shot per game than in years past. To speak on the defensive side of things, steals and blocks are down from 2015. They are They are... It's a very slow decrease. I, I'm, I'm talking like, I believe it was 2015, the league average for steals per game was 7.7. We're down to 7.3. Blocks was 5.0, down to 4.7. But that speaks to the defense not getting any better. And maybe we're starting to regress a little in defense. I also think that guys like Steph Curry are a huge reason why... This is now an offensive league. Steph Curry, the reason why I have him as the best point guard ever, and that is also another conversation for another time, is he literally changed the game of basketball, mm-hmm. and you're seeing it before your eyes with the stats. The stats show it. The three-pointers are up. The three-point attempts are up. The field goal percentage is up. The pace of play is up because Steph Curry likes to push the ball. He's going to take those quick threes, which translates to more possessions in a basketball game. People want to be like Steph. People want to go and drop 35, 40 on any given night, and they have the ability to go drop 50, 60, 70, 71, like we just saw with uh, Donovan Mitchell, which also, shout out Donovan Mitchell. He seems yeah. to be in a better situation than he was in Utah. This Cleveland team is pretty good. Oh, yeah. They're they're dark horse, for sure. They're, this... They are a sleeper in the Eastern yeah. Conference, for sure. Lastly, I think the offense is getting better because that's what sells. Honestly, you're not going to get the bag by being pretty good on offense and really good on defense. You're not going to go get 46 million. Like, if Trey Young averaged 
six points less per game, but was, but was better on defense. Is he going to get a $46 million a year contract? No. He's not going to get a max or a super max or whatever he got. And we're seeing this in every sport. In football, offense wins. That's why Kansas City is a favorite every single year because they have Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey and a West Coast style offense by Andy Reid that's just going to put up points. That's, I mean, that's what wins. That's what, mm-hmm. I mean, Buffalo is likely going to be a Super Bowl favorite because they have a crazy offense. Defense doesn't win championships anymore. It just doesn't. We're seeing this in hockey as well. It seems like the games in hockey are higher scoring than what they used to be as well. You talk about these wing players and the centers in hockey, and I can only name you one defenseman in the in the NHL, and that's Kale McCarr. He happens to be the best. And he plays for the hometown Colorado Avs team. But I can name you one defenseman, and that's it, as a casual. So I think the casual fan watching the NBA is going to know the Stephs, the Lucas, the Giannis's, because Giannis is kind of the exception because he's really good on defense too. But these are guys who are like household names who can drop 50 on any given night. I, I mean, the, the stats show that the offense is just getting better, but to kind of cop out a little bit as well, it does seem like, especially when you watch a game as well, there's just a lack of effort on defense overall. Yeah. And no, I, I agree with you in that. I don't think it's a cop out to say that it's both, but I also think that this is all an environment that the NBA has created. So you talk about the, I don't know when, like you would say the switch would be, but it's hard to defend in the NBA now, not just from the sense that 100%. Yes. The skill of these players are getting better. We just talked about how um, (laughs) Isaiah Joe was cut last season from the team that drafted him and is now all of a sudden a core rotational piece for a rebuilding team and just dropped 20 points on uh, one of the best teams in the league. Okay. But it's, it's just, it's tougher to defend because the rule changes that have been put in place by the NBA have not been in favor of anyone that's all in, in defense. All these changes have been more favorable to offense. And I'm not, I'm 100% not discrediting Donovan Mitchell for what he did. The 71 point game, phenomenal. So don't take it this way. This is just pointing out a stat and a fact. He shot 25 free throws that game as well. He went 20 of 25 from free throws. So 20 of those 71 points came from the free throw line. And you see this all the time, too, when Joel Embiid or James Harden have big 40-point games. What's the big thing that you're looking at? They are getting fouled, and they're questionable. If anything, they should be no calls, almost. Or they're very ticky-tack fouls that are happening towards them. Now, sometimes they are legitimate. And I'll say this, it's a legitimate strategy to foul someone like Giannis because he's shooting like 60% from the free throw line. So, yeah, when if he's on a on a, uh, a breakaway, just hack the man and let him go to the free throw. Chances are he's going to miss one of them. And so, and then those points are going to add up. He's going to miss like six or seven free throws. And maybe that's the difference between you winning and losing the game. But it is hard for a defender now. You can't you know, the hand checks, hip checks, things like that. You can't do that anymore, which those have been rules in the NBA for a long time. But then you have the rip through fouls and they're trying to fix that a little bit now where it's not a shooting foul anymore. But for a solid four or five years, that was just that was egregious to watch what James Harden and Chris Paul were both doing when they were in Houston. Those rip through fouls, getting all of that. It was ridiculous. And some people might say that it's a skill to understand the rules and bend them a little bit. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. That's just that's not a good taste, in my personal opinion, as right. a basketball purist and a and a and an old head in a young in a young head's body. Um, but, but yes, it's it's obviously, it's obviously both. It is both, and I don't think it's necessarily the case that. And I think there's a lot of elements that are true. And again, I'm going to, I, I, I hate bringing in my Grizzlies into this because I know it's not the same. They're just one team in a 30 team league, but they are the team that I watch the most. And so I just, and they're also the number two team in the West. So they are having success, but their flaws are the same flaws that a lot of other teams are having. They just so happen to be able to overcome some of those flaws to have more wins than losses. They have had trouble with getting out on three point shooters. They're, they have one of the worst 
perimeter defenses in the league. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're they're going under screens. They are not taking advantage of their of the size that's down low. I will say that I I believe the like the blocks and the steals going down specifically the blocks is because you're seeing less and less people driving to the rim and you are seeing a lot more shots from the outside. But I will also say that is because that no one knows what actual guarding position is anymore. There have been countless number of fouls for my team against my team or when I'm just a neutral spectator of guys that are going straight up, but they're like, no, there was body contact. So that's a foul and that's two shots when that shouldn't be a foul. There's no physicality in the game of basketball anymore. I hate to really sound like an old. Well, and that's, and that's the whole point that. of when they teach you playing basketball growing up just to stand like this. Yeah. That's the whole point. But, and that's why when you see guys and they get called for fouls, they just keep their arms up like this, this like yeah. ref, I'm straight up. What am I supposed to do? And so it's just, I think the rules and the officiating have helped create this instance where it's like, what's the, what's the point on defense? Almost it's, you would rather just kind of pack the paint, let them shoot 26 to 30 feet shots and hope that they miss and just focus on rebounding and then running out in transition. To, to the credit of the NBA though, they almost have their hands tied to make the rule set favor offensive players. And because it, cause it's, it's all about the money, right? right? If you have a, your Monday night double header, the night caps on TNT or whatever, and the final score is like 86 to 81, people are turning that game off at halftime. Yeah. Nobody's watching. It hurts the viewership. They're not getting the ad money in, whatever. But if you have a team that it going into the fourth quarter, it's like 96, 91 and people are shooting the lights out. Everyone's tuning into that game. So it, it seems like their hands were tied almost to make rules like that. I'm not saying that that's the right thing to do. Yeah. Cause like you said, rip through fouls. It was a, a plague almost for like a half a decade, basically. Like you said, it was a plague, and they're finally starting to correct that a little bit. Same thing with shooting fouls. When the shooter kicks out his leg, mm-hmm. they create contact, and they call that a, a shooting foul. They're not really calling that anymore. They're just leaving it a no-call. Or in some cases, like Chris Paul mostly, they're calling offensive fouls. So they're they're trying to correct some of those really, really bad calls, but some of the rest of the calls, are they. it seems to heavily favor offensive players. Yeah, and, and another one that is being talked about a lot is the charge right now. Should the charge even be in the game of basketball anymore? And again, I say that it should still be because you've already taken out essentially every other tool that a defender has to stop the other team. And now now you're ripping out the one thing that they have. Now, I do agree that it should be called better. I do not like the call, and I've seen this numerous amounts of times, where someone goes for a floater or a layup, they release it, and as they are coming down, they're still outside of the restricted area. Someone slides in as they're coming down, take the body contact, and they call that a charge. I do not agree with that at all. I think, if anything, it should be the the same rule that applies on the three-point line and being in the landing space of the shooter should apply for that as well. Obviously, right. you have like a defender and everything that's there, but if they're coming forward, they, they still have to go, they still should go straight up or whatever, you know, and it's easier to block a shot like when it's like going at the rim or anything like that. Anyway, um, they just need to call that rule better because then that is going to just be another tool. Like wh- then what are you supposed to do as a defender? You can't, you can't hand check people. You can't be physical whatsoever. And then it also, what's, what's the purpose of being in help defense? If besides just like being in the passing lanes or trying to, you know, deter someone from going to the rim, if why why should the defenders why should defensive mind players in the NBA or basketball in general be punished for being in good positioning, knowing where the restricted area is, knowing what's happening, and getting in a legitimate defensive position and absorbing the contact and taking the charge. And again, I think the charge is just it's been called horrifically because like guys are moving still and they're calling it a charge because like oh he you know, there's a little bit of contact and he was in front of him, but like he was moving. I've seen dudes fall sideways and there's a charge called and it's just a dude that's running. I understand like the whole, like lowering the shoulder and everything that's going to get called every single day of the week. And it should be a charge. But again, it's just, it feels like every single new rule that is passed in the NBA 
it hurts defense more than anything else. And, but sometimes, like, you know, we just talked about, they do make some rule changes that do help it, like the rip-through fouls. That is a nice change of pace, thankfully, because that's how James Harden essentially made his living in Houston was with the rip-through fouls. Exactly. Exactly. So, and I think we're both on the same page where it's kind of a little bit of both, but I like to add in there that the NBA has kind of created the atmosphere with the rule changes over the previous decade and as well as the emphasis on because it's hard to shot stop Steph when he's shooting the ball from you know 30 plus feet away and and also interpretations of the rule the gather step you know we have the James Harden step back that is clearly to the naked eye looks like a walk but it's like no it's a gather step and now everybody's doing that and it creates just that much more separation for you to get your shot off and to have a clean look at the basket i see everybody doing that that shot now even players that i like are doing the exact same thing and i'm like it's it's, hurting dude it hurts my soul because it's because like it's a travel it is come on it's a he's carrying the ball (laughs) but now they have the Oh, but it's the gather step. And then mm-hmm. the worst part about this is is young kids who are in like AAU basketball or playing like middle school and high school ball, they're going to start seeing that stuff and they're gonna be like, well, they're not calling in the NBA. I'm going to try doing that stuff too. And it's going to create those habits in younger players that are not good. Yeah. So they're not good habits to follow. You, you want to idolize a guy who – rift throughs to get to the free throw line who clearly travels to create space but due to technicalities or whatever they can sort of get away with it that's just that's not a good thing to follow but everyone's going to go after those big kind of guys to to like mimic their game off of and it's going to create bad tendencies yeah and if we also want to go with interpretations of the rules and i'll I'll admit it man my guy jaw he does it all the time carrying is like putting putting your hand on the bottom of the ball and then you're stopping, you're manipulating. It's a lot easier to control the ball when you're doing that. But right. by the rules, it's a carry it's and it's yep. a travel. The the refs don't call it. And that's just another thing that defenders have to deal with is extreme loose interpretation of the rules. And that's what makes it that's what makes it so difficult. So I don't I guess the in my mind the correct answer isn't that one necessarily has gotten better and the other has gotten worse, which obviously offense has gotten worse. It's just that the interpretation of the rules have become so loose that it favors offense so much that you can have five or six guys on any given night on one team that can go off for 20, 30 points when you're like, that guy, that guy did that. Like, are you, are you kidding me? Or you have guys that are stars in this league that are popping off for 40, 50, 60 points a night because they can take advantage of some of these. Like, I know Giannis can, like, make it to the basket in, like, two steps, but he's got a little bit of a gather step move to create like some most space. Big players yeah. Have at least a little something. Yeah. Every, every one of them, every one of them, every one of them does. But I, I think we could talk forever on this, especially you bringing up the AAU thing because. We have the AAU generation that is now getting into the NBA, and they are all they all play a similar style of basketball. And if you want to see the worst of it, look what's happening to the Houston Rockets right now. The Houston Rockets are an AAU team. I watched it's one of the worst clips of basket offensive basketball I've ever seen in my life. It was all five guys touched the ball, and they all tried to ISO. And when their ISO didn't work, pass it off to the next guy, and he tried to ISO. There was no offensive game plan whatsoever. It was strictly. AAU basketball. Let's find the mismatch and see if you can beat your man. If not, pass it to the next guy and yep. let him try. It's horrific. It ruins the game of basketball. It's, dude, people may not want to admit it, but basketball is not training in a good way. It's, it's, it's just, not. It's not. It's not. And I think, like, viewership numbers for the NBA kind of prove that, too. Like, there's a lot of people that still watch the NBA, but I saw it was like the top 100 watched programs in the nation and it was like the only basketball that was on there was college basketball it's like top 100 or top 50 the nba did not crack any of it it was all nfl ncaa some olympic events and some college basketball and it was like you know march madness stuff right so but 
Anyway, guys, I think that's going to do it for us here. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoyed the video, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. That helps us out tremendously. Garrett, thank you so much for coming on. I know this was fairly last minute. I don't know if you guys could tell it was fairly last minute from us. Um, very busy. Everybody's busy. It's a busy time of the year. And just me personally uh, working two other jobs and then trying to find time to sit down and record a podcast while working on other things that I've got going on in the background for the YouTube for Vendetta. Um, it's tough to find to find time. And it's also been tough for me personally, too, to find time to watch a lot of these NBA games so that way I can have takes that I'm I'm fairly confident <laughs> and that way right. that way I don't sound like I'm spewing too much like idiotic nonsense up here I gotta sound like at least I know what I'm talking about a little bit a little bit a little bit you know fake it till you make it you know that's the game plan that's,